Well, good morning from the uh, warmest city here, or rather the city with the warmest beaches on uh, the, con the continent, and also the first city to host the inaugural Bio-Africa Convention. I am Fifi Peters. Now, for the next uh, three days, hundreds of stakeholders, policymakers, decision makers, entrepreneurs are going to be gathered right here at the Durban International Convention Center discussing how to advance Africa's biotechnology economy. Now, the economic benefits of biotech are vast, as many are well aware. In agriculture, we are seeing how it is increasing food security. In health, we are seeing how it is reducing the burden of disease. And in industry, we are seeing how it's making our planets a lot safer to live in. Collectively, we are all aware that combined, the African economies present a marketplace of over one billion, billion people. Uh, speaking to the significant opportunities for making uh, profits in this area. But then what do African countries need to do to enable the billions of dollars that are currently circulating the global economy to feel welcome and to feel safe here on the continent? This is going to inform the panel discussion that is about to take place right now. And I'd like to introduce my esteemed panelist, beginning with the Honorable Mrs. Mamoloko Kubai Ngubani, who is South Africa's Minister of Science and Technology. We also have Dr. Jelai Dai, partner at Aurora Equity and chairman of Ag Food Tech USA. Professor John Oma Mugabe, who is the Professor of Science and Innovation Policy at the Graduate School of Technology Management, the University of Pretoria. Mr. Barlow Manilal, CEO of TIA, which is the Technology Innovation Agency, and also Dr. Siabulela Ntutela, who is CEO of Africa Bio. Thank you so much for everybody's time this morning. Uh, Minister, thanks so much for your time and for this opportunity. And if you allow me to begin with you, we are convening here to talk about how Africa is open for business. And we do know when you talk about open for business in business terms, you're referring to an enabling environment. So can you talk to us about how South Africa initially, and then perhaps speak to the operating environment on the continent, is open to attract capital. Thank you very much. And just to, again, greet the viewers at home, those who are following our discussions. I think if you look at how South Africa has traveled in terms of since 1996, with the first white paper being established post-1994 elections, um, setting up institutions and all that, and the landscape that we have, now, when you look at that, you'd see that we've really created a stable environment in terms of policy, um, which is what investors look for. Stability in terms of policy, certainty in terms of policy. As you, you might have picked up when I addressed, I also spoke to the issue of intellectual property, which when I was at Boston, for example, it was raised with me. And when we engaged, we realized that there were certain elements that maybe colleagues had not picked up. and we confirmed to engaging further. Creating environment does not mean only in the point of science and technology. It's around regulations, for example, those who are coming to South Africa who are looking at making uh, their way here, dealing with business, so it's broad. Issues of visa entries, quick time and turnaround time. And as I said, I normally sit with um, I've sat in a number of platforms where the president was engaged in the business sector, where they were trying to find issues that we need to address around um, making sure that we enable the environment. And one of the areas was raised was visa application, which Minister Kikaba is, re is responding to. And I think within the coming two months, we'll see the changes around that. So we're looking at holistic area, both as government broadly and as the department, regulation, policy, and creating stability. But again, we are unique as South Africa and Africa around the issues. I spoke about the indigenous knowledge system. 
as the South African and the African continent, that we have that opportunity for us to be able to partner with global companies in where we are rich. This is a huge, rich heritage that we can be able to take advantage of and grow our economy. So those are some of the things from policy. I spoke about the issue of strategy that we have in place as South Africa, the indigenous knowledge system bill that is before parliament. I mean, those are some of the things that I can speak to, just to say this is what we're doing. Another area around the ocean, Pakisa which is a government program that is doing very well. Biodiversity is one of the elements. So it shows it's led from a president's point of view. It shows there's leadership as well, because part of the issues is that when investors come to a country and into the continent they look for, those are the areas that I think we are doing well and we are more even into engaging, listening to the feedback on some of the areas, if there's still areas of us to improve as a country. I'd like to just uh, skip a couple of people there and I want to speak with you, Professor Opa, about the face of the biodiversity or bioeconomy here in Africa. And I'd like you to paint that picture for me because of your experience having worked in many other countries on the continent and also your experience of being engaged in other, in other policy in other parts of the world, such as the Netherlands. So can you just describe what our bioeconomy face looks like right now? Th thank you. Yes. Uh, uh, let, let me talk about biotechnology, uh, not the bioeconomy. Uh, and I'll explain later why not bioeconomy. Um, uh, biotechnology uh, and the discussion on biotechnology uh, for Africa's development has been around for almost 30 years. Uh, we've been talking about the potential of this technology for at least 30 years. Uh, during that time, uh, during that period, a number of countries have made uh, efforts, uh, countries such as South Africa, Nigeria, Zimbabwe, um, um, Kenya, have designed strategies, biotechnology strategies. Um, a number of countries, very few countries, have gone into implementing those strategies, and you see products uh, in, in those economies. Uh, biotechnology is being harnessed um, uh, and applied uh, in agriculture. Uh, there's uh, a number of countries um, uh, are commercializing uh, 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 biotechnology-based uh, products, uh, BT cotton. There are very few. Uh, there are very few uh, countries on the continent that are engaging effectively with biotechnology. Why? What's holding them back? Um, I think the minister has uh, made reference to two uh, important uh, aspects uh, why, in fact, uh, the continent is not doing enough in the area of biotechnology. One is what I call, again, uh, leadership, political and executive leadership. Uh, we don't have uh, articulate leadership on the continent, from the African Union to the regional economic communities to the, the countries. Uh, very few African leaders talk about this technology. Uh, if you go to the African Union, uh, you start with the Agenda uh, 2063. There's just passing reference to biotechnology, and it's ab about marine and aquatic biotechnology. You find only two, I mean, biotechnology is referred to in, in two, uh, two places. Aquatic. What is it, because perhaps they haven't awoken to the opportunities that this technology presents, or why is this not part of their conversation? Uh, there are a number of, uh, of political economy uh, factors, uh, very complex factors. One is, uh, and uh, I mean one has to be brave to talk about this, uh, Africa is torn, is in between what I call the transatlantic uh, divide on, on the technology. Um, if you go to Addis Ababa, you'll find the European Union there. And the European Union advances a particular, uh, particular view, world view about this technology, biotechnology, and tends to take Africa 
and African leaders that direction, uh, then you have the United States for America that has a particular particular view on, on, the, on the technology. So the issue of leadership is, is important in the sense that uh, uh, we, 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 African leaders have not become really resolute uh, on biotechnology the way they are with other technologies, particularly information and communication technologies. I think the other issue is one of uh, uh, policy clarity. Uh, and, and coherence, consistency. All right. All right, let's just, let's just put a pause there because I want to flesh out the issue of a policy stability minister. You did also mention it in your address. But Barlow, perhaps you can speak to me about the issue of funding. I mean, you practice in this space, and are you finding that the reason why more and more money is not being invested in biotechnology on the continent because of a lack of ideas or because of a lack of bankable projects? Yeah, I think the first thing we must uh, dispel the notion that there is not enough talent in the country and on the continent. Um, South Africa has rich, as rich as its biodiversity. I think the, the richness in terms of, of the people and the ideas that they come up with, um, certainly not just in, in, in South Africa, but across the continent. So as far as our ability to generate ideas, we are at the leading edge globally. I think the problem that we have is providing the support mechanisms that can firstly identify these ideas and systematically support them through a process um, to take them to the market as well. The one problem we do have is the bright people in our country, I think they lack the conviction of being global leaders. And I think we need to work through that where we must stand up and ensure that South Africa, our ideas, our IP, we can fight for them and ensure that they, are, that they become leaders globally. So it's very important that we move to the NSI to make sure that it becomes a lot more efficient, but also that it repositions South Africa and the continent as well. Um, so in terms of the, the funding, in terms of availability of funding, uh, demand will always outstrip um, the supply. And I think that is because we've got such a rich um, capability in the country as well. So when you tend to do that, you've got to filter a lot more, you've got to make choices, you've got to restrict. Uh, I wish we had a budget of in excess of a billion or two billion per annum, but I think we've also got a lot of other social priorities we need to focus on in the country. So what do we need to do? We need to ensure that the, the entrepreneurs, the scientists out there become a lot more efficient in terms of how they go about processing the ideas, taking them to the market. They need to also ensure that they become a lot more business savvy in terms of accelerating it to the market versus focusing exclusively on the science. Take the science, but ensure you bring business and infuse that into the process. And we need to get a lot more private sector involvement in the process as well. So the starting point is there, the holy grail is there, the knowledge base is there. We just need to look at the partnerships that take it through to the market. Mm. And in terms of becoming a lot more business savvy, uh, Dr. Jella, I'd like to speak to you about this because you said that in your experience with working with uh, African entrepreneurs, you found that sometimes we were quite uh, lacking when it came to the knowledge of doing business. You did propose a possible solution to also address the issue of support as being perhaps a corporate a venture capital fund being established to target African entrepreneurs specifically. I mean, how are you, or where, where, are, is, where is African business in thinking on the same wavelength as you in terms of doing some of these things that you're putting forward as solutions? Perhaps I would want to sort of turn it around a little bit what you just proposed, that I don't think it's the job of corporations to come and reach out to the young people to teach them how to do business. It's the job of families and, and overall government to make sure the educational system is properly set up and the kids are educated. And then it's, it's, the, it's a cultural thing as well. So in the US, for example, I give you a very simple example how we, our kids, learn to be business oriented from very early on. Lemonade stand. They become entrepreneurs at a very young age with minimal you know, investment or whatever. So it's that kind of cultural thing that kids, you sell 
Girl Scout cookies, you do lemonade stand, you do at the high school or even kindergarten, you have competition for who sells more or of this and that. So it's this kind of early exposure to entrepreneur, to making money in the market, dealing with the market that helps the kids be business-minded. And then, of course, our system, our educational system is horrible, I have, I have to regretfully admit. Uh, not the college level, but uh, K to 12 is very lacking. But, but the culture is such that kids are exposed to business experiences. Sure. And perhaps this is something that can be encouraged within your K to 12 at a younger age, capture their imagination with business, find ways for them to make a little bit of money. And sure. that perhaps would be helpful. And then as they go through the system, then they can get formal education by going to business school, or you can have hackathons, you can have boot camps for any age. You can have boot camps for any age group. So I think there are lots of different ways of informally doing it. Sure, and Madam Minister, I know that your department is quite instrumental right now with doing a lot of hackathons and various competitions in coding right now, but Dr. Sia, Sia Bulela, perhaps you can speak to me about so the vast opportunities in the agricultural sector for, for biotechnology. We've got a population that is increasing, a uh, population that needs to eat. Talk to me about whether multinationals are actually piling in to eat up the opportunities that we are currently or currently present in our agricultural sector? Yeah, look, I mean, the reality of it is that most of the African biotech uh, corporate sector is, is multinationals, and, and which unfortunately is the case, but it should not be that, that way. And in order for the technology to have its greatest impact, I think one of the speakers mentioned that the technology also has to have full meaning to small-scale entrepreneurs, small-scale farmers, and the broader African population in order for them to, to, to appreciate what this technology can do uh, to, to, to change their lives. But that being the case, you know, we cannot then put aside the role that the corporates are playing in that, you know, because they develop the technology and the cost of taking that technology from the laboratory all the way to the fields, especially in the agricultural sector, is quite high. And hence, we need to have that partnership between the big corporations, but also partnering with small uh, entrepreneurs, with small scale farmers, to make sure that that technology then gets cascaded down as far as, 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 uh, as the communities are, are, are based. That also will make sure that we don't, uh, we don't look at biotech as being forced onto us by big companies, but is a, is a way of saying we are actually partnering between the, the, the developers of the technology, but also the consumers and the, the small-scale farmers. Because if there's no that, uh, that interact between the big and the small guys, we'll still be saying biotech is being forced onto us by the small, uh, by the big corporations. Sure. And Dr. Ndanta, for you, I mean, as the president of BioAfrica, what, what do you make about the ability for business to do business in this space on the continent? I think, is that working? I think one of the things that is often overlooked, and it's quite interesting to observe it, is to pretend as if nothing is happening. So people often speak about a nascent industry, a developing industry. And yet, if you look around, if you woke up this morning in the breakfast uh, in this country, 80% of the breakfast is a result of biotechnology. It's the Agricultural Research Council, which has over the decades been supported by government. If you look or you go into a clinic, it's the same story. And I think the argument or the discussion should move away from a lack of recognition of what is empirical evidence to trying to package that evidence in other ways of um, describing it. So I get very, very, very discouraged when people talk about the lack of industry participation, the lack of the agricultural space or agribio space is dominated by multinationals in this country and in the rest of the continent. The GMOs, um, that we see that we use as part of our stable diets 
um, come from multinationals. And Africa, I must say, I must hasten to say, has probably got the most liberal framework for commercializing GMOs in agriculture. When I say most liberal, I include the European Union and the US. And so we have to celebrate the victories and we have to celebrate the achievements that we make as a continent. And I think as we move on, I think DG mentioned the European Developing Country Clinical Trials Network. Um, that is starting to yield fruits after about 10 years, a decade. And I think you'll start to see more and more of these things as biotechnology addresses our problems, whether these are HIV problems or infectious disease problems. Africa is a platform. The continent is a platform. South Africa is one of the prominent regions in the African continent, not necessarily because of the amount of effort or the output, but because we live in a society which is much more advanced in terms of communication and branding and packaging of our messages. All right, so you say that we're doing a quite a lot and perhaps we need to pat ourselves on the back a bit more. But Minister, coming back to you, you did raise the issue of policy uncertainty. And I'd just like to draw in on the amount that has been invested in biotechnology so far, that 1.5 billion rand. And I'm trying to understand what your targets are. As you mentioned, there's quite a number of investors from all over the world, all over the continent that are here. They're interested to do business. What are you targeting? And also, what is your message to them when they wake up and read a tweet from a certain US president on Twitter talking about <laughs> land going or the land debate going. Did you have to remind Unfortunately, me? I, <laughs> you mentioned the geopolitics in your, in your, in your presentation. <laughs> I had to. But what is, what is your message to them? Because there was a multinational that we were speaking to once that said, if South Africa is looking at changing constitutions in this area, what about possible changes in other areas. So your message to them as you target more investments about should there be more changes in our laws as maybe there needs to be as we try to achieve a more sustainable and inclusive environment, that their money is still safe. Um, let me start by saying, if we have an economy that is growing but it's not inclusive, it's unsus unsustainable. That's the first threat. So to make sure that the economy is sustainable and we can guarantee it for the future, it has to be inclusive. Now, I'm saying that in the context of everybody understanding where South Africa comes from, we cannot continue with an economy that has majority of its population in the margins. That's a huge threat for us in this country. Hence the issue and the importance of making sure that we develop a system that is very inclusive, that can be owned up by every South African. So that's why it's important to understand that context. And that's why when we did our constitution as the country, the constitution that was developed post-1994 took cognizance and of where we come from. That's the first thing. But secondly, we have institutions. We've developed a system in terms of our governance that we have three separate arms of government, which is the executive, the, the legislature, and the judiciary. And many can testify over the years, over democracy, that as South Africa, we have stronger systems of our governance and political system more than many countries globally, even developed countries where you find independent judiciary that can take decisions outside the executive influence, you, where you find political, in terms of political participation, inclusive, where you have over uh, various parties, political parties, where you don't have one party system. You have a, a diverse, where it also parliament guarantees that diverse, that cross and checking balance of the executive. Those are some of the things that I'm saying. In terms of when you look at our system, you have to be very aware of understanding what our political system is. Then lastly, the changes in the constitution is provided for in terms of our laws. So it's not something that is unexpected, but we provide procedures. Now, I would be worried if I was an investor, if South Africa, for example, wants to change the constitution outside the legal framework. 
If you look at the process that is being done and how our laws are, who has the right to change the constitution is parliament. Parliament, which is a platform of multi-party system. Now, coming to the issue of land, should the people who invest in the in agriculture be worried? I don't think so. We've engaged quite a number of people, and I think I want to put the issues of Afri Forum aside. They are being reckless, and I want to say it up front, they are being reckless, and they are not being patriotic, and they are not telling the truth. Majority of South Africans, both black and white, understand the importance of ensuring that the past injustices are addressed so that when we go forward, we don't have an, a system whereby we have people uncertain about their future. But we are saying that shall be done within the confines of the law where we ensuring that no one, and I think the president has been very clear, and I want to say to most of the investors, please look out for what our president has said. That's the position of this government, that is the position of the ruling party in this country. That there shall be no land grab, there shall be nothing that is done outside the confines of our law. We have a system that is transparent more than any other countries. Majority of the countries are not as transparent as we are as South Africa. Where it's predictable, it's clear, it's easy. And I say again, listen to what AFRI, Agri SA is saying, which is a role, it's a sector that we are engaging. They have been even able to say, please, AFRI Forum, stop what you are doing. Sure. Because they understand the confines of how we are doing things. And I want to assure investors that as South Africa, we are a responsible government. We understand the impact on the economy. We understand the impact of food security. And we shall never jeopardize that. And that's why I'm saying, last week even worse, the president was in parliament asking, answering these questions. And it was very clear. The messages on our websites, is very clear, it's there, the statements are there for people to read and understand what is saying. And I leave for the President and the Minister of International Relations to deal with another head of state. I don't want to venture into that. But just to say, I think, just to, because I don't want to find myself in that space. And I think the President is engaging broadly on that. But just to certainly say, from where we are sitting as government, we engage robustly, but we are a transparent system. We have a very, very open democracy where everybody is able to see. I mean, the participation the, that Parliament is doing of involving all South Africans across race sure. is one of the most transparent process. Now, I don't think there's a need for anyone to fear what is that. Allow South Africans to determine their future across. That's why we are saying all sectors, including those who are in business. By the way, you have black farmers who are there, who are vocal as well to say, this is what we want to see. White farmers who are, and they're living across. The issue of crime exists, yes, we are dealing with it as South Africa. We have to deal with it across, whether it's gender violence, whether it's issues around farming, uh, killings, both black and white, whether it's issues around the robberies that are happening. And that's why we have been focused as government led by the security cluster to ensure that there is sustainable way of ensuring that our crime rates go down. For sure. What about the issue of low economic growth, though? Because I do understand that uh, international investors, some of them are keen on the continent, but some of them say our economies are not growing fast enough. I mean, Jella, can you speak to this? The issue of low economic growth, do you say to some of those people that getting now, because Africa is trying to sort itself out and ramp out its growth, so have first mover advantage, or do you wait? Do you wait for, are you asking? For the good times to roll. I mean, it depends where you are. Uh, and, and when you say US or Europe, you're not talking about some definable uh, entity. There's, there's so many different pieces and different sets of approaches that it's hard to make a big generalization. Sure. So some people want, some nations, some groups, some people want to be on the cutting edge and create opportunities in a place like Africa. Some would wait the game to unfold and 
There's still money that's being directed towards advancing biotechnology. In the US, you mean? In Africa. In Africa. Uh, I don't know how much money actually comes from angel groups in Africa. I would like to know. Uh, but, uh, but actually, it seems to me that the angel communities are not very strong. Is that an, I don't know, is that a, is that a, a, Barlow, perhaps you a can valid see, yeah. observation? Yes, yeah, that is the case. I mean, the angel investors, I think private sector investors are uh, not as prolific as, as government support entities uh, in, in the country. And I think it's, you know, there's various reasons for that. I think the big thing is, you know, with the advent of globalization, you know, angel investors put their money anywhere in the world. So our, you know, they, they don't have a um, focus on saying let's for the exclusion of great ideas across the world let's just focus and be patriotic so in South Africa angel investors uh, and, and VC funders generally are patriotic to dividends in some instances um, so the activity in South Africa is growing but it's not uh, to the extent that it is in, in the US it is fledgling at the moment yeah in general I think not just Africa, I travel all over the world, even many advanced economies, uh, they do not have sufficient risk, what I call risk capital. I mean, South Africa is a rich country. Say, you know, Australia is a hugely rich country. But yet when you look at these countries with all kinds of strength, the one missing piece is risk capital, the amount of risk. I'm not saying it doesn't exist, but relative to the capability of these countries, the amount of risk capital is not sufficient to move things fast enough. So it's, it falls upon the policymakers to set up the right incentives for the risk capital to come in, whether it's from in, domestic source of risk capital or foreign capital that says, okay, uh, the policies that they have put in place have de-risked it a little bit. That environment has been de-risked a little bit, so I can go in. Mm -hmm. So I think risk capital is something that really needs to be focused on. I mean, talking about incentives and partnerships, um, Dr. Sbrilala, perhaps you can join in here because you were talking about the importance of PPPs in the sector, particularly in the space of agriculture. So how do we get more of those going? Yeah, I think uh, the essential part of it is that government has to create an environment that's conducive for, for, for business to, to partner with them. And, and, and obviously on the other side, business has to have an appetite to, to, to engage and, and partner with government and to, to build those relations because one party cannot do the, the entire value chain of, of economic growth. One depends on the other. So in our, in our opinion is that uh, in the case of South Africa, for example, we've been demonstrated that, that uh, the role that industry can play in making sure that government implements its own policies is quite high, and the example is that of the bioeconomy strategy where government went to industry and said, what are the areas of growth, and how can we as government create that environment that's conducive for us to grow the set of bioeconomy, but government cannot then go out and build industries and develop technologies. That's when an industry comes on board and says, now that the policy is there and all the instruments to implement that policy are there, how do we then as industries start to provide the, the resources to to make sure the economy is growing through the technologies, through the support, and, and, and so forth right now. So it's always one part must create an environment for conducive sufficient enough, but industry must then come in with both capital, with technology, with human resources to implement those policies. That's how I see then the, the partnership between government and industry to, to play to play a, a, a 
critical role in any economic growth systems. And I mean, if we're looking at South Africa's case in terms of our business, so we are reading every other time in terms of business confidence being low. So within this challenging environment, I mean, what's 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 what should the policymakers' message be to business to lift confidence and get them to invest? I think. It, it depends on what I mean by, by, by the general view is that the business confidence is low. I don't think it's that, that, that low, especially in the case of South Africa. Right? The, obviously, political systems always create uh, uh, uncertainty to industry on whether is that a stable political environment that we can go, we can go in. But South Africa has demonstrated over the years that our political system has been very stable, and hence the, the, the confidence by business to say, irrespective of what the system are, once we invest in that country, we are certain that uh, uh, the policies that are there will not change overnight, and then suddenly our investment is not is not guaranteed. That's one. But secondly, uh, having looked at the agricultural sector, I mean, if you look at most of the uh, major uh, corporations in agricultural biotech, they are based in South Africa, and they are doing very well, and they are working very close with government in multiple of of initiatives. The same applies with the pharmaceutical industry, where you see almost all of the big pharma, they are based in the country, and none of them has ever felt that they are in an unstable environment that they want to move out. So the, the confidence is, uh, it's just a matter of how do we then translate that, uh, that industrial confidence into products and services that the people can start to benefit effectively on them. Those, which is why then we're here around this table to say, let's, t let's see how best can we then start to take those technologies and make sure that they're effective to the people. But confidence is there. All right. right, so you're reiterating the message that uh, Dr. Ndandla was saying, that we are doing well. But obviously, as any human being, we all want to do better than just well. So how do we get there? I think one of the most important things that we need to acknowledge when we have these discussions is the timelines. So when we have a discussion like this, we often have to look back and say, how long did the rest of the world get to where it is now? It's pointless for us to be comparing ourselves to places where it's been going on for half a century, for example. You must remember that biotechnology in the US started around 1969. The first um, pivotal moment was in 72 when the first genetic engineering experiments were successfully concluded. So we're here, let's say 50 years later, and we should not rush and try and compare ourselves to jurisdictions that have been in this space for a much longer period of time. But do we have time to wait, given that everybody is talking about the advancements of the fourth industrial revolution and we don't want to get left behind? I think the answer for that is what the DG spoke about in one of his last slides, which was the convergence of technologies, where in terms of power technology, of power economy, you need to harness the convergence of nanotechnology, ICT, and all of those. In that way, you are able to leapfrog and accelerate your own development. So you don't pay the school fees as, as high school fees as the rest of the world did. So we do have time on our side, and I think very critically, the key thing is that the government continues, and this is one of the a few, I would imagine, that um, industries where the role of government has not been acknowledged, the consistency over the past two decades where government started with a simple biotechnology policy and has consistently invested it, in it. I think you've been saying that 1.5 billion rand is, is it enough. I think the way to do to ask that question is to compare it to the actual size of the venture capital industry in the country. Sure. 1.5 billion rand in a bioeconomy that is nascent, that not many people have an appetite for, is massive. You know, if you think about parity calculations and those type of calculations, you will realize that the size of the investment and all we can as an industry pray for is that the government continues on this trajectory, sure. does not lose hope, and we as an industry embrace 
the commitment that the government has shown in biotechnology. Uh, Professor John, uh, just your, your, your view as a lecturer on the level of skills or the readiness of the workforce here on the continent to be taken up by perhaps multinationals who come here, who partner with small businesses and open up uh, innovation hubs here. Yes, uh, again, bi biotechnology is a uh, knowledge intensive for uh, industry, uh, science intensive. Without uh, skills, uh, no country can ad advance, no company can, uh, can engage in biotechnology. And mo most of our challenges are around the right skills. Mm -hmm. uh, the technology is moving very, uh, very fast, uh, the science becoming more complex. Do we have the right skills? Genomics, for example, bioinformatics. Uh, where, where are the skills? Mm -hmm. Are our universities uh, creating the right skills uh, for, for, for biotechnology? It's a big uh, po policy issue. It's not just uh, about money, putting money in biotech, mm -hmm. but uh, wh where are the skills to actually engage with the, with the technology effectively? Uh, the skills are in very short supply in most of uh, of, of, of Africa. Um, where you have the skills, the scientific infrastructure is not there. Uh, I know persons who have gone out of Africa, been trained in bioinformatics, genomics. When they come back, they, they don't have basic equipment. Uh, so one needs to look at skills, but also the infrastructure uh, to utilize the skills that are, uh, are created. All right, but as we are, we really are driving this conversation forward. I mean, looking at uh, solutions and talking about what is already being done. And Minister, I know that you are doing quite a lot in upskilling the the young people in the areas of science and technology, but also in integrating government systems in this area. So perhaps you can talk to us about should we be concerned that our levels of maths and science will continue in the, the manner that they are here in South Africa and, and how, how do we improve? Yeah, indeed, in terms of the work that we're doing, we, we, we do that in partnership with the two departments that are responsible for education. One, the basic education and the higher education and training. Um, and, and we do play our role as the Department of Science and Technology. In terms of our role, in terms of um, in the area of basic education. Obviously, we do our outreach science engagement. We do have a strategy in place um, where we're engaging, more encouraging young learners at high school through our National Science Week and partnering with various institutions and schools. You'd remember government launched what we call the Naledi, the Naledi Schools, where it was specifically to encourage maths and science. So we're playing a role there, and I think we still need to do more in terms of quality for kids to be able to compete. And with our white paper DG was presenting earlier on around our white paper, new white paper 2018, part of what we're looking for is to be able to have a very much collaborative work and so that we can be able to say even those who have passed through um, the system, are they able to help to contribute to us that? Because the skilling, it's very important to make sure that the children don't get just education, but the right, the right education for the economy, which is important. And in this area of bio, um, biotechnology, is very critical for us to expand. And I think linking that, I just want, if you allow me, to go back to the issue of the economy, sure. growth, and what opportunities are. Yes, part of the issue that we're doing, if you can look at our economic growth, yes, we projected not very well. We projected certain percentages of growth. We are not getting that. But you look at what the World Bank has produced. World Bank has said to us as South Africa, I, I was reading the report recently, where it says innovation will be able to assist us to get out of the economic difficulties, and that's what I want to focus on. Innovation, because we're investing as government, as the colleagues have said, we're investing into the space in terms of biotechnology. But our efforts cannot be much if they're not partnered. And that's why we're looking for the partnership. And hence, this dialogue is important for us to get feedback. What are the areas, if it's around creating a conducive environment for investment, are we having that? If not, what are the areas that we need to improve? Because we're very keen, and most of the colleagues would remember the president will be hosting an investment conference in October. 
And part of what we are trying to understand is that is our environment, one, because conducive as South Africa, but secondly, we see ourselves as South Africa as the gateway to Africa as well. So we're creating a launching platform to say we can partner, I mean, the African free trade that has been launched by our heads of states, are there elements that we can be able to benefit out of that? Through SADC as well, as a regional body where we participate as ministers of science and technology, are we seeing opportunities? Are there advisors of the colleagues who are sitting around here to say, Minister, we are interested in investing in South Africa, but these are our challenges. These are the areas that we think you should be limiting. But we cannot do it alone as government. As we invest, I would want to challenge the colleagues who are sitting around here to say, match our investment so that it can have potential. This is one of the areas, or this is one of the sectors that has potential to grow. If we communicate well, if we partner well, we show leadership both from government, business, academia, and civil society. If all of us can stand up and say we're going to partner, we'll see this sector growing. And that's why I want to even re-emphasize that. That's why in South Africa we saw importance of not only saying host, but invest in the hosting of this conference, because we think it has value. And that's why I'm saying, for me, importantly, it will be to receive the feedback I'm glad with um, Dr. Dyer, the feedback that he gave to say, let's improve our business sector. Let's support the businesses, the entrepreneurs. Maybe what, one of the things that we have to do with TIA going back is to say, in the support that we have, it's not only about money. The soft support that has to come for our entrepreneurs in this sector, what is it that we can give? And that's what I'm saying, openly saying as the minister, what are the other areas that are hampering for you as investors to come into South Africa? Is it knowledge about our market? Are we not marketing ourselves more? Is it knowledge about what we do? Is it knowledge about... Um, the capabilities and the market. Well, sometimes sure. people say we are a small country, therefore, but we're saying if we are to collaborate with other African countries which we are partnering, that's why it's a bio-Africa, not bio-South Africa. Sure. So that's, that's what I just wanted to highlight. Thank you, ma'am. Mr. Barlow, perhaps you can add on to that. The minister's uh, asking for the expectations of investors. She's wanting to know more feedback from investors about what your expectations are to foster stronger partnerships. Your view. Well, in terms of, in terms of um, investors, you know, when you asked the question earlier on about uh, risk funding, sure. I think this, we must make the distinction between risk funding that's high risk, high reward, and risk funding where there's high risk and low reward. And, and generally, I think private sector is looking for high risk, high reward. Mm -hmm. And we take a developmental approach. We go high risk, low return, or low reward. Then comes the other issue around which I think doesn't find a lot of resonance with, with funders, which is patient capital. I mean, people need to invest development, um, uh, incubation support, etc., are not something that you expedite. You need to, I think, go through a systematic approach. Uh, and I think that's where the disjoint comes in, in terms of investors are generally looking for um, you know, they, they have the, the capital, they want to invest, they're looking for short, quick returns uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an environment that has less volatility, um, a lot of policy certainty, and South Africa certainly has that as well. But I think we need to just change the paradigm to look for where government is not the only role player providing high risk, low return, or more patient capital in the, in the process as well. And I think if you look at the fundamentals for investment, uh, I agree with Dr. Nsomi. I think we need to be a, a lot more circumspect. Uh, we shoot ourselves on the foot very often, largely because of the lack of awareness. We don't sell the South African story well enough in terms of where we're at, in terms of the great um, uh, you know, innovations that we have in our portfolio. Uh, you know, you very often you get, uh, I use this, uh, you know, this narrative all the time, if you have an international competition, and if we send 10 South African companies to Silicon Valley, I can almost guarantee a South African company will be in the top three. Mm. And if a South African company is in the top three, you're almost certain they're probably gonna win it. Mm -hmm. That happens in the US, it happens in France. You know, what is that? That's a good validation of the capability in the country. 
sure, sure. And I think we need to celebrate that. We need to get investors to look into South Africa. And it's also important that they focus on the developmental agenda that we have, because that's the only way you are going to collaborate and complement the efforts that government has put in place as well. For sure. And if we just bring you in, Professor John, as well, to speak to the issue of um, investor expectations, and maybe you can just elaborate a little bit further on uh, policy. I mean, South Africa has got quite a sophisticated uh, policy in terms of protect, uh, protecting intellectual uh, property rights, in terms of biosafety. Uh, how, what does the situation look like on the rest of the continent, given that this convention that's being held here is a springboard into the rest of Africa? What's the situation in terms of policy looking like there? And how do we also tailor that towards investor expectations? Yes. Uh, m most African countries have, uh, most countries have policies, uh, whether you're dealing with the intellectual property protection, uh, biosafety, most countries have policies. I think the challenges are around policy implementation. Uh, and most countries struggle uh, implementing their policies. Mm. Uh, I know almost at mm. least uh, 25 African countries have relatively good intellectual property protection laws. Uh, the, the issues are around enforcement uh, of, of those laws. And you require resources to implement the policies. You require institutions uh, to enforce uh, uh, legislation. Uh, there are issues, challenges are around in my view, around policy literacy, uh, lower levels of policy literacy. In most countries, uh, uh, policies exist, uh, but we don't, we don't really know those policies. All right, so we need to implement. Uh, and therefore, we cannot effectively implement them. Sure. Um, uh, you, in most countries, you have uh, uh, legislation, uh, but we don't know <laughs> the specific provisions so you cannot implement them. All right. uh, and that affects investment, uh, foreign direct investment in, in particular. All right, so raising awareness there. But, you know, it's so encouraging to have this conversation because you really get the sense that, you know, South Africa and even Africa as a whole, the opportunities and what we're actually doing in this space is great, but we're not talking about it enough. Mm -hmm. So, Dr. Ntantla, Going forward, I mean, how do we ensure that we are marketing the opportunities and the kind of returns that multinationals are experiencing here more, monitoring those processes to ensure that a situation or an economy that's already doing well can do better? Yeah, I think, I think you've hit the nail on its head. Uh, I think the biggest challenge is marketing is making people aware of the victories, if you, if you want to call it. And I think I want to go back to a specific example um, to illustrate that point around the national bioeconomy strategy or the national biotechnology strategy, which was uh, formulated in 2001. One of the great success stories that I never saw in the papers was about three to five years ago when one of the companies that have been supported by one of the biotechnology regional innovation centers for a princely sum of 14 million rand at the time, one for just under a million US dollars, was sold to a multinational for 443 million US dollars. Hmm. And no one said a thing. So if you want to talk about whether there are opportunities to make a massive return, that's 400 times the money that was originally invested. And there's quite a, a long list of such notable achievements. If you look at the gold standard in HIV care, monitoring of treatment, CD4 monitoring, the gold standard globally was a technology invest, invented at Vets University, at the Vets Medical School, again with the support of the innovation um, grants that the South African government has been providing. And there's a number, there's a huge number of victories that I think we need to be making um, rather blowing our own horns. Sure. Even in the agricultural space, Pana, which is just down the road from um, this city in Peter Marisberg, out in Greytown, was sold to one of the big Egg, bio, egg biotech companies, global egg biotech companies, 
for quite a substantial amount. So from an investment perspective, I don't have any worries. And I just think people who want to look can look and find. And as I said earlier on, the, the, the entry or the barriers to entry in biotech are probably less than a lot of engineering intensive industries because they are driven more by knowledge. So, um, so perhaps companies like yourself should uh, ramp up the PR there so that media agents like us can leach onto those stories because that's a phenom phenomenal success story. I mean, if we just get some final uh, comments uh, from uh, you, ma'am. And, you know, particularly in the opp or potential opportunities that you see for impact investors to enter this space. Actually, impact investing is something that is center stage right now in, in the US, and I see it in Europe and other uh, countries. Now, I want to say that from my perspective, every single venture investment that I see in science and technology, at least, is an, is an impact investment. Mm. To me, it's become a catchphrase from a lot of people who want to show off that they are doing something good. We are all doing something good. When you develop, you know, HIV AIDS uh, vaccine or treatments, whatever, you're doing good. You can call it social impact, you can call it VC investment, but they're all social impacts. Uh, to me, that's a catchphrase nowadays. Right, we more than more than real investment. Right. Thank you so much for those views. We are running out of time. Just final thoughts from you, Dr. Siabulela, as we uh, proceed and we wrap up this discussion, and then a final thought from the minister. Yeah, I think uh, the the message that Dr. Somi mentioned earlier on that says our problem has been that we don't talk much about our achievements and we, we achieve and we hide. Part of what we are trying to achieve through this BioAfrica Convention platform is we want Africa to showcase those stories, you know, tell the world that we have a potential as a continent to develop products that have an impact globally, but within our own uh, small laboratories, within our own corner laboratories. And through this platform by Africa, we want to make sure that the world knows that they must come to Africa almost every year to look at where can they put their rents and dollars and yen and so forth, right, in our own innovations that then they will take abroad to, to the world. Minister? I think um, just to echo the sentiments of the colleague and colleagues and, and go further, and say not that we have done well only, but there are opportunities that exist because we have success stories as proven track record mm -hmm. of how well we have done. And therefore, out of that, it should give confidence that in those opportunities, we can be able to develop a success story, not only for South Africa, not only for SADC, but also for the African continent. And I think we are open for business, both as South Africa and Africa, and to be able to contribute broadly in the biotechnology and bioeconomy of the world. Well, thank you so much, Minister. And judging from the conversation that has just taken a place here, I am quite uh, hopeful and optimistic about the kind of business deals that we will see taking place here within the next uh, three days. Africa is open for business, as we have heard our uh, Minister of Science and Technology say. But from us here at the Durban International Convention uh, Centre, it is goodbye for uh, now, and we do uh, trust that you enjoy the rest of your day. Cheers.